Three weeks from today, there will be new faces added to the people looking down on you above. That's because the class of 2017 will be enshrined in just three weeks. And today's guest will have his face raised to the rafters as well. Let me tell you a few things about Manny Jackson before getting Mr. Jackson out here for you. Not only is he a former Harlem Globetrotters star himself, but he is one of the most inspirational and important figures, not just in sports, not just in entertainment, but in American culture and history. He is a man who quite literally was born in a boxcar before elevating to one of the most influential businessmen and CEOs in the nation, in the world. He was the first African-American player for the University of Illinois and the first African-American owner of a major international sports and entertainment uh, enterprise, the Harlem Globetrotters. Yes, played for them and owns them. Think about what that would do for your, uh, for, for your life, if you could own the business you worked for. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for class of 2017's Mr. Manny Jackson. Thank you, sir. Thank you, take a seat right there. Okay. Welcome to Springfield, Mr. Jackson. Springfield. I think, no. I, I think the script says that. I love Springfield. Yeah, <laughs> I love Springfield. Now, I want to start, if you don't mind, um, where I usually finish, because our circumstances today are relatively unique. There are only four or five other people in the world that I could ask this question to, which is to say, today, in this moment, sitting here in the Basketball Hall of Fame, where your face is not up there yet, but in three weeks it will be. Can you put this in a context for those of us today who will never be sitting in your seat? What does today's experience feel like to you? Well, that's a hard question to start with. Sorry. I've, I've been dealing with that for a few weeks. Uh, you know, whatever we do in life, we kind of want to be thought of as doing it decently. Yes, sir. And uh, having left some footprint behind that says you were here. And I think when I talk to players who've gone through the, uh, the Hall of Fame, it's, it's that reality of the millions of kids around the world who played this game and coaches who've done what they've done. The fact that you're being remembered in a place like this, it's like it becomes hard to process it. And you wonder, how can, if you use numbers like 50 million or 100 million, how does it end up that you could be one they're talking about that's one or three or 400? And first of all, you say, I'm not worthy. And then you think, you know, God determines that. And there's a reason I'm here, and I gotta figure out a way to use this platform like maybe it was intended. But I'm still processing. It's an amazing, amazing compliment to a life that uh, at this stage I'm very proud of. I'm still working on it. Maybe we'll have it in two weeks, I'll know what I'm doing. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, basketball and, and this nation is better because of you and pioneers like you and your life. And so I want to talk about um, your book, From Boxcar to Boardroom, is, I, I was telling you off mic, and I mean it, one of the most important reads um, of my lifetime. I mean, it really just sort of is a, an only in America tale of a man who was quite literally born in a boxcar, sometimes lived with 12 family members, and step by step brought yourself to a place where you are now one of the most influential CEOs and business people in, in the world and a basketball Hall of Famer in three weeks. Fran, I said in three weeks. And so can I ask you when basketball first, when do you first remember basketball capturing young Manny Jackson's imagination? Uh, people didn't, my daughters didn't believe the boxcar story, by the way. And they didn't. I, no, I took them down to Ilmo, Missouri, which, Nick, you know it's on the Illinois Missouri line, and they decided to decide what state it's in. Ilmo, Missouri. Huh. My grandfather was a straw boss on, a, on the uh, railroad. He had a crew of people who worked on railroad tracks. His compensation was to get a boxcar. So 13 of us moved into that boxcar, and that's where we lived, and that's, that was home. And 
And I think of the boxcar. It came to me one, one day in New York. I was at the, uh, one of the corporate headquarters. I was on the board of directors of Stanley Tool and Ashland, and we had a combined meeting of, uh, of the boards. I looked around at the walls, mahogany walls, and my name was on a gold plaque in front of being a board member, and this one of Saturday boards I was on at the time. And I thought, how in the hell does a black person leave a boxcar in Missouri, end up in New York, and they're serving us parfaits and special meals, and people, how do you do that? You know, years ago, you'd say things like, only in America. It doesn't come out very much these days to say that, but I thought, what an amazing country. What an amazing possibility. And I went back to my girls, my daughters, and I wanted, wanted to go on to Columbia and the other gone to NYU, and I wanted to tell them, and they went, oh, Dad, come on. So the book was really a letter to my girls. And it was really a letter to try to tell them how, and I'll tell you this too, and you know this, every step you take in life ends up being a, a result of the decision you've made, either consciously or unconsciously. You get a lot of chances to make mistakes, to make bad decisions along the way. But at the end of the day, you make more good ones than bad ones, which means you don't have to be perfect. And I can only conclude that of all the decisions and intersections I had to make a call, I recognized that to make a call, and I must have made a lot of right decisions. And my grandfather told me when I got uh, a little older, he said, wherever you are today, he said, take that as a platform to plan for where you're going to be tomorrow. And I didn't know what he meant when he said it. I was 12 years old. His point was, you should plan the day how tomorrow's going to be. Prepare yourself for the decisions you've got to make to succeed and be in the next step tomorrow. And I think I spent a lot of time realizing that this is temporary here. The next step or the next day, the next two days, I'll be in another situation, and I've got to be ready for it. You know, I love going to weddings, and I think, I hope those people are thinking about 10 years from now or five years from now because it's going to be different. <laughs> And my daughter, my, my youngest daughter, is having her. Can I tell this? I'll tell this story. Please do. It's a great. She's having her second second child, and it's kind of cool because her son, where's 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 Fran? Fran's not here. <laughs> he calls me Wobbin. He's he's a, he's a fan of Batman, but he calls his pop pop Wobbin. I'm, I'm Robin. I'm Robin. <laughs> so she's she's having her second baby, and she wanted to have it the day of the eclipse. Yeah. So. I'm going back to L.A. from here to, to, to attend the, uh, attend the, uh, the birth, birth of my second grandchild on the day of the eclipse. And I, I, said, I said, Cassie, what if something weird happens on that day? She said, well, just name it. You, you won't be Wobbin anymore. We'll name him Wobbin. <laughs> but, but I said, you know, you got to think about this stuff. When you, when you, you have this ch child, what's, what, what's going to be the story you tell them? when they're 15 years old or 20 years old, that you waited, did all this stuff to have the, uh, my grandson on, on, on the eclipse day. She said, I'll worry about that when I get there. <laughs> anyway, that's what I got to look forward to the next three or four days. And I, I, I just love the idea. She wants to do something special. And my oldest daughter named her, her, her daughter, her middle name is Jackson, to, to keep me in the family. And, I, and this young daughter is going to surprise me with some name so that it gets remembered. So we'll see what, see what happens. So think about me on Tuesday or Wednesday. I'll be a grandpa, and uh, I've gone through the eclipse, and no telling what will come out of that. You're, you're due for a boring month. I mean, in the last, <laughs> you're going <laughs> to yeah, put that out there. It's <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> kind of weird. It's been, it's been a great life, a great journey, I'll tell you that. If you don't, if you have a chance, and they say you got a choice to come back as Manny Jackson or somebody else, put me on your, in your top five list. It's, it's been incredible. Do you think, <laughs> I like it when a presidential candidate says, make America great again, or I think, She's just been pretty good to me all the way. I don't know <laughs> when did it go bad. Come out of a boxcar and every decade something cool happens. I don't yeah. know. We're, go yeah. ahead. You got, I, no, I love yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, so on behalf of our friends at Hager Clothing, who uh, provide all of our Hall of Famers with their beautiful Naismith orange uh, jacket, Hall of Fame jacket, um, I want to ask today's uh, Hager Innovators question, um, which deals with a, one of the first most significant um, ceilings that you shattered, uh, which was your recruitment um, and playing as the first African-American player in the University of Illinois' history. Now, obviously on the court, things went remarkably well. We would be naive if we didn't ask about 
the, the, the courage and the strength and sometimes the, maybe the, the wherewithal to ignore stuff that was happening to you. Can, can you talk about that moment as a trailblazer and, and if Manny Jackson ever got to a point with the adversity that you were facing off the court that you thought maybe, maybe I could just make this easier if I, if, if I didn't run through this wall right now? It's so much you forget in your life and some things you don't forget, and I, I'm sure something else happened, but the most important word in my life is, uh, is aspiration. And I think uh, uh, civil rights people talk about it as being hope. Uh, I think when you stop expi aspiring to be something, uh, aspiring for something to happen, that's when it gets to be, be frightening, and especially if something positive is going to happen. And I think the turning point in my life when I, when I discovered the feeling of aspiring, seriously aspiring to be something. And uh, it goes back to the Harlem Globetrotters and the meeting of, uh, of Abe Saberstein, the founder. And I told him that when I saw him, I knew nothing about basketball, by the way, I was just a kid out of a boxcar. And I told him, I said, I want to be where you are. I'm going to play on this team. And he said, uh, finish college. And he walked away. And he said, finish college and come see me when you're through. And I thought, what the hell has college got to do with playing with the Globetrotters? But I talked and thought about it more, and I realized that uh, what he meant and my aspirations changed at that moment. I was put on a path of aspiring to get through high school good, get through college when I want to, and I'll go back and see that little guy. And uh, I never stopped having an aspirational moment where there's something I aspired to do. If I got involved, I had another level of aspirations I had. Now, some people say that's not cool, be happy where you are at the moment. I was never happy with the moment. I wasn't sad, but as a board of director member, when I was what size of the company, I always ask the question, what's next? My first day on the board is always, what's wrong with this company? What could we do better? And as it turned out, I became a valuable board member because I had the companies always aspiring to improve, improve something because the aspiration in my life had always been to make tomorrow better than today. And with people around me, I want to make their days better than it is today. So that was a turning point, the meeting with Abe Saberstein when he said, go to college, you can come join the Globetrotters. And I started aspiring to be a student, to be a Globetrotter. Crazy, huh? It's wonderful. <laughs> Crazy. And then in 1960, you graduate, and you do join the Globetrotters. But only spend a couple of years before leaving to join the corporate world. And we're talking about the 1960s, eight years before the Civil Rights Act. We're talking about 1960, a very, even the, the, the pre-seminal moments. Um, can you talk as you sort of go into the corporate world and then really spend the next three decades out of basketball, ostensibly, how close was basketball still to your heart? You were busy building, businesses as one of the great corporate movers, and yet you came back to basketball. So I, I have to wonder, was basketball always in Manny Jackson's cards? Did you know that that day would come? Huh. When I left college, and this is not, a, I loved the University of Illinois, and I loved talking about the college days, but frankly, uh, the mistake I, that was made in my life at that point, when I say a mistake, I went there to be a basketball player. And I had no idea uh, other than be a basketball player. And I knew getting through that basketball playing would get me a career in basketball. When I was suddenly graduating, I realized that uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't on the same playing field that my white counterparts were on because racial discrimination was terrible. When I applied for a job, they always said, send a photograph, and I knew when they saw my photograph, they'd be thrown to the floor. But I knew that it, I'd wasted those four years in college. I say wasted, I, I was concentrating on basketball. So I went to the same, when I went to college, you took some tests called, uh, they were qualifying you for which English class they put you in, rhetoric they called it at the time. And I asked if I could retake the test. And I qualified for the highest level of, uh, of, uh, of rhetoric or English. And then I went to a seminar at the university for, for science fellows. 
and I had no idea that I had, a, had, a, uh, I had the ability to think scientifically. So I went to take a test for a National Science Fellow. And the only, I was the only athlete in the room, and uh, the people who were administering the test knew I was an athlete, and they said, you know, you, you can stay. But these are for people who've gone through the university to be, uh, to be sci special science programs. And at that time, we were worried about the number of scientists we had coming out of universities. Well, I took the test and finished in the top third of it, or something like that, some number that. And I told him, I said, how do you know that stuff? I said, I guessed at everything on here. I didn't. <laughs> but I apparently had an aptitude for it. And I knew that if I didn't have clearly my mind about being uh, a college student, if my test scores weren't great, uh, I wouldn't make it. So a basketball friend of mine took me to General Motors and said, uh, you can come in here, but we want you to, to take our, our, our exam our test. And the gentleman's name is John Watson, who has been around uh, St. Bonaventure, you know, his wife and his family were deans and instructors up there. I took that test, and I went through the wrong door. <laughs> I took the test for the, what do you call it, General Motors Institute, GMI, where the engineers get tested, <laughs> instead of the general test for everybody else. <laughs> I'm sitting in the room with a bunch of folks that had gone through engineering school. <laughs> I took the test, and I'm thinking, I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> but I took the test. And, and truthfully, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that hard wow. for me and for some reason. And I, so I came out, a gentleman named Jim Oliver, who was the director of education and placement and stuff, said, OK, so you cheated on that test. I like your personality. I'm going to have you take the test again. I said, well, why? I do OK, so you did, you did the engineering test. And you test high enough to be on the staff of the institute to be there. And I said, I don't want to be teaching up in Flint, Michigan, or wherever it was at the time. I took that test, and I realized I probably have an aptitude to do something with myself. Yeah. And I, then I thought about basketball. I said, now I've got to get trained. I've got to think. I've got to compete. I can't use excuses. i just got to be better than the guy, person next to me. And I did have this feeling about building teams, and I, which I got from sports. And to say the rest is history, because I, I knew I was smart enough. I knew I knew how to build teams. I knew no one was going to work harder than me. And I knew that what you read in my book and you hear my speech at the Hall of Fame thing, I knew my goal was to make myself better, better and the organization better and the people I work for better. And I said, no one's going to work harder doing that to me. And my life is following those two or three things uh, made it work. By the way, <laughs> I tell young kids now, you've got, you got to make your parents look like heroes. If you do that and they get better, they're going to love you. They'll give you anything you want. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, and I, I, when I go, to, they say, what do I do in this interview? I said, you know, don't ever go to the interview and say, I want to take your job. Tell the person, you go in this, I want to make you a hero. The guy you're going to, person you're going to work for, the gal that you run the organization, you're going to make her the smartest person in the building. Because she goes, you're going to go. That's brilliant. And uh, it's helped me. Yeah. yeah. So it's made me a lot of money. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's great advice. I'm when spending, you, when you can end with, it made me a lot of money, that's great advice. I'm spending it right now. <laughs> I'm sorry to go so long on that, but it no. makes you reflect on stuff. When you get older, you reflect a lot. And you want, you, want to, you want to try to put it in a tablet or something and give it to younger people because they're going to either miss it our, uh, our past up opportunities. And again, that's why I think from boxcar to boardroom is, uh, is a significant, regardless of where you are in your life journey, it's a significant read. Now, here's a part that I didn't tell you about for all the audience members that I'm really excited about. After this question, if there is something you've always wanted to ask Manny Jackson, a question you want to ask a Hall of Famer in three weeks, uh, then I will ask you to get this question to ruminate on it, and then I'll ask you to raise your hand. One of the great Hoopal staffers will recognize you, put you in line over here to our right, your left, and you will get a chance to ask Mr. Manny Jackson your question. So in 1993, you make a move that effectively reshapes uh, sports and American culture, um, saves an American icon. You purchase the Harlem Globetrotters. Now, in a moment, I want to ask you about a really significant, because no one's been more close to the Globetrotters 
than you in your entire life. I want to ask you about the most significant sort of inside story that no one here has ever heard before. Is there one story that really just immediately pops to the front of your mind? Well, I, I, I always say one. There's probably three or four, but uh, the Globetrotters arguably was, they were the greatest basketball team ever. I mean, when you think of teams that could beat easily anyone, that was the Harlem Globetrotters. And some of the older folks here in their 20s and 30s, I'll tell you, imagine today that if the top 15 African-American players were playing on the same team, uh, what it would it be like as they traveled the world? That would be the Globetrotters. Because they're just gifted human beings that played like no one's ever played the game before. But what happened is the team got so popular uh, from beating other teams competing, and the segregation was so, so difficult that Abe Saberstein took the team out of the country, and it got to be people came to see the exhibition. So here's the inside story. Globe Towers have won, I don't know, 15,000 straight games or 17,000 straight games, some ridiculous number. And they play against a team called the Washington Generals. So here's the inside stuff. You didn't know this. The Globetars are supposed to win. <laughs> it, it's supposed to win. But here's, here's what we do, though. You make the Globetar team by, uh, by making sure that you, how can I say this? You make sure that you win. So there's moments in that game when there's competition against your teammates, against the other team, and gets your own uh, numbers. So when the players go on the floor, they're scared to death. They're scared to death because they know they can't miss free throws, they can't lose out on defense, and the other team can't score more than some level of points we set for them. Once they get past that, they relax, and they start playing competitively. There are nights, like any night you have, where the team has not been able to do that and it ends up being in the fourth quarter. And that night, we play five quarters. <laughs> the Globetrotters do what they want to do. <laughs> play five quarters. <laughs> so the inside stuff is every night is competition at the best the nights you had before. If you're an 80% free throw shooter, you have to shoot better than 80% that night. If you're playing against the generals and the generals are leading in the first quarter for whatever reason, you got to pound away until you get a lead. And then, then we start playing competitively, or start to put on the show. But the players keep their jobs or lose their jobs based on how they play every night. And that's why when you see the Globetars, they're constantly practicing, and most of them are really good because they're going against their own analytics, and they know they have to perform well every night. And the games are meant to be won by the Globetrotters, except we pay the college all-stars, the national teams, or Olympic teams, or like we did uh, in 2004, 2002, 2004. We challenged the Argentine national team to the world championship. When they beat the U.S. Olympic team, we offered them a million dollars to play us uh, in Miami and a million dollars to play us in New York and a million dollars to play us in Las Vegas in the best of th three series, two out of three. And each night they played us, we give them a million dollars. And then we got, we got scared because they were a good team. But we didn't show up because they were broke. They couldn't get to Miami. And they wanted advanced money, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mail them in advance to get up there. Let's go on. That's another story. But... Globetrotter stories, you want to have, have me talk for years, I can tell you stories. Oh, oh, let me tell you one. Let me tell you. Please, I'm, I'm, yeah. I was going to say, we've got years. Let me, let me tell you no, one, we're not going to. I was a good friend of Nelson Mandela. So if you read the book, you probably know that. Good friend of Nelson Mandela. He asked, uh, asked I'd be ambassador to South Africa. But one of the things he liked was we liked talking about how to get through difficult times because South Africa was going through difficult times. When he, when he came out of uh, 27 years in incarceration, he said, how do we celebrate the freedom of, of, uh, of South Africa. And we're sitting in the intersection of the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian, Indian Ocean in, in Cape Town. And I said, why don't we invite all the kids we can to come to South Africa, to come to, to Cape Town? He said, OK. The Globetrotters will play. And I thought, why don't we have our own Independence Day celebration? And the proudest moment of my, absolute proudest moment of my life was get him to, to agree and put everybody to work on it. We had a July 4th Independence Day celebration in Cape Town, and we fired rockets, fireworks, craziest stuff into the ocean at 
sundown, and it was the most, it was one of those moments where all of us who were Americans over there cried. I saw Madiba cry, and we looked at that and said, this is really a symbol of freedom, absolute freedom. And the fact that we talked about that over tea in the morning, and he called all the resources together to make the basketball game turn into a celebration of independence with the fireworks American style going out over the ocean. Uh, still sticks with me as being one of the most touching moments uh, ever. And it also tells me the leverage of, uh, of the game of basketball and the leverage of just doing something good for this country and for the world. And it's one of those nights I, I'll never, ever forget. That is staggering. So that is staggering. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for Mr. Manny Jackson, please raise your hand right now and be recognized. One of the great Hoop Hall staffers. Oh, I see some people ready to ask questions. This is great. Put you in line right here to uh, our right, your left. So since the moment in 1993, you mentioned challenging Team Argentina, and I, I love that moment. What was one of the, and you pulled that team from the brink. I mean, that organization was really on the ropes. What were some of the innovations that, that you and, and your team um, advanced with that organization to make sure that not only did it come back, but it became once again the most important basketball club in the world? I can only, I, several things, but I'll tell you one thing that I did. That I did. Uh, access to professional basketball was, is not easy. I mean, it really isn't easy. And if you go to every city, major city in the country, there's some incredible young men and women playing the game of basketball. And they're playing it every day, and they're playing it crazily good. As a kid, the way you made the Harlem Globetrotters is that you went to a school in the south side of Chicago called St. Athlam. It was a church school combination. They had a small gym about this size. And you waited your turn to get into the gymnasium to go be viewed for a few minutes by the founder, Eve Saberstein, and some of the old players that were there. And people would come in in buses and cars and bicycles and all kinds of ways, and the streets would be just crowded for that Saturday and Sunday, which they, which they played. Actually, Friday night and Saturday all day. And it occurred to me, I want to see every basketball player in the country that's not in the NBA and not in college, so we can pick the best from that group. And the first time we called for an open tryout, I think we had something like 10,000 wow. to show up for it. And you think there's a lot, of, a lot of good athletes and ball players. What we found were there were kids of this size, that size, that really wanted to play. And we took the time to, to study every one of them and a panel of coaches and a panel of evaluators to pick the 20 or 30 best kids, best in attitude and that kind of stuff, and best players. And that, to me, was not only innovative, but it was also like probably the coolest thing I did. Yeah. Three years later, we did it again in my hometown in Southern Illinois, a town called Edwardsville. And we, every gymnasium in that area, we had kids coming in to play and show their skills, and we picked some really good kids. In fact, four of those kids will be at the Hall of Fame celebration um, you know, in September. Awesome. It's going to be interesting to see them, and they're doing great. Oh, the true democratization of hoop. That's what that was. No, no college credentials. Just show up. Show up and play. And we gave them a meal. and just show up. In fact, people donated food for it. They wanted, wow. They donated food to them. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Mr. Jackson, I'm sad because that closes my portion of the question and answer session, but now we get the hard ones. I'm not sure if you've noticed over here, we save the hard ones for the kids. So I only have two requests, one that you let me hold the microphone and two that you introduce yourself to Mr. Jackson before you ask your question. I'm Brianna Lee. And my What's your name again? Brianna Lee. Brianna Lee, beautiful my name. Question is, what was your motivation to get to this point in your life? My dad calls me the, uh, the black Forrest Gump. <laughs> and he said, wherever I look, I see you doing something different. No. But uh, I guess you'd call me an opportunist, and you'd also know that I, I aspired to be, not only be great, but I aspired to make other people really good, great at things. And uh, when, I, when I got on that track of doing that, uh, Forrest Gump did a lot of things. And I've been in a lot of places. And it's all well documented and all talked about in my bank account accounts for it, my contributions to charity do that. But I just aspired to be better and make other people better. I really wanted to make people great. And once I got on that track, my phone rang, people would come to see me, and I worked hard at making other people great, as good as they could be. And that was part of the aspiration I got that first time when I met 
little Abe Saberstein. I aspired to be in college. Had no idea about having an aptitude for school because I was ignored by the teachers because I was of color. And I realized I could think better than most people could, but I aspired to make other people great. And I just kept moving and moving and taking opportunities. Kept looking forward. Thank you. Good question, by the way. Thank you, Brianna Lee. Mm. I told you these were good questions. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Oh, excellent jersey. Look at this, Mr. Jackson. Good choice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kendra Lee. Um, I was wondering, what was the hardest part about being, the glo like, uh, being a globe trotter? The hardest part ended up being the, the most addictive part, travel. Uh, every day you played. You're in a new, new city, new town, driving along these highways and stuff around this country and around the world. And it's really hard because you come out of the, the facility and you had like at 9 or 10 o'clock and you had to find something to eat. And generally it was a bunch of crappy food on the bus every night, you know, loaded boxes of fast foods. And you had to sleep because you had to either drive all night or go to a hotel and get up at 6 the next morning to get to the next town. And you hated it for a while and then you got addicted to it. Nobody wants to give it up. That's the hardest part, the travel between cities. And you couldn't, sometimes we play in the afternoon someplace in Chicago, then play in the night at Milwaukee. So you have two games a day. But the travel is hard. But it's also the thing I miss most about, in fact, my kid says why well, I have three homes. Because I keep traveling from house to house all the time like I'm a globetrotter. But it's, it's hard, but you get addicted to it because the fascination you have with people drives you. If you really look at people and listen to people, it, it just drives you to be, it's just a thing that just drives the crap out of you. And uh, the hardest part, new players don't like to travel when it starts out. They realize it's hard. You have to sleep on the bus, sleep in the locker room, sleep where you can. But once you get in front of folks, like I'm tired of right now. I mean, tell you, I got to go back to, where am I going? Tonight, Las Vegas when I leave here in about four hours. But I sit here now, and it's like somebody's pumping adrenaline through me. <laughs> Globetrotter stuff, you know? But travel is the hardest part. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to go so long on these, but that's, I'm trying to go from the heart on these things and tell you what's happening with it. I don't think anyone's upset what? you're going along. What? This what? is wonderful. Next one? It's important for all of us to hear. Um, my question is, before the game, do the Globetrotters plan out with the other team? Like, I make, you make these many points and then you keep purposely missing shots and we win. No. No? No, no. Now, the analytics for the Globetrotters themselves are maintained by someone on the side. So, if, if they're making four out of ten half-court hook shots, any night they make three out of ten, they got to practice. Or they have, they're getting difficulty. They've got to aspire to make four out of ten or five out of ten by preparing for it. The other thing is, if it looks like, if someone fakes it on defense and tries to let someone go, they sit down. It's, uh, it's pretty pure. And that probably is the way you explain how the, the level of performance stays so consistent and so good every, every year and every, every night. They really work at it, and they know the analytics are being watched, and they perform at their best all the time to keep those great jobs they have. Excellent question. I think a lot of people were thinking that, too. Thank you. Great question, buddy. Hmm. All right. This guy looks like he means business, Mr. Jackson. Oh, boy. He's got that Boston shirt. My name's Brady. Hi, Brady. Who's your favorite basketball player right now and why? Hey, guys, don't get mad at me now. <laughs> My favorite player, I wish you were playing right now, is a guy named uh, Chauncey Billups, but he's not playing right now. They call him Mr. Big Shot. And I like, and I use an example. You know, I, I love LeBron. I think LeBron may be in the top two or three of all times. And I think he's so good and so dominating that we, and he's not a self promoter in the way that some of the ball players are, a street self promoter. Uh, so we underestimate him a lot. But I, I like uh, Chauncey because Chauncey knows the game. He knew the game really well. He studied the game. Plus, he was an ultimate team player. And uh, in tough moments, he knew how to make everybody on the floor better. He spent more time, even today. But if he's not working at 3 o'clock this afternoon, if he's in Las Vegas, he's at a gymnasium there with a bunch of NBA players, and they're practicing or playing. 
and he's working all the time making those players better. And he's been out of the game for a couple of years, but I just like the way he thinks. I like the fact that he can shoot when he has to. I like the fact that he would, he'd rather have his team play well and win. And uh, it comes naturally to him, just the kind of guy, he's just a good human being. Stefan, uh, it's going to be that way. Uh, but that's my favorite, Chauncey Billups. Who would you say your favorite is? Isaiah Thomas. He's, he's, pretty, he's pretty, he was at Phoenix, you know, for a while. Nobody works, nobody works harder than him. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Hey, be sure to Google Chauncey Billups. He was a Celtics draft pick, bud. Hi, guys, how are you? What was your favorite part about being a Harlem Globetrotter? And it still is, by the way, I should say, travel, the, the, being out of the country. Uh, the fact that uh, whether you went to Japan or Kuwait or Paris or London or Hong Kong, being able to represent the United States out of the country and being able to, uh, to meet with students and parents and people, different backgrounds, different beliefs, and for some period of time, uh, for an hour or two, we all come together around that. Uh, we went to the military bases in, uh, in Iran. Uh, it was fascinating to see the young people, really young people, who were representing this country, fighting for our, what was, what's important to us, our values, and being able to spend time with them and sitting like this, reminiscing about home. And, and you can only do that as a globetrotter. Mm -hmm. And it really felt good to be doing that. And uh, sometimes I have to tell you, I feel like paying the organization for, for doing it. It was such a great, great, wonderful experience. Uh, something I wish everyone could get, out, get inside of and try. Amazing experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go. Two to go. This is when they ramp up a little bit, Mr. Jackson. What advice would you give a young basketball player? It's kind of like what I'd give anyone in life to, to try to get in touch with uh, early on what you're, what you're best at. And uh, there's so many facets of the game of basketball that you, you're not going to be great at everything that's going on. Uh, you talk about Isaiah Thomas, young Isaiah. If I, young Isaiah tried to be the world's greatest three-point field goal shooter, he's probably not going to get there. Are the greatest defensive player because of his size, you finally get there. But there's nobody takes to the basket, and nobody, nobody seems to be able to break down the defense at every level and every phase he gets into better than him. So my point is, once you find out what you're best at, it just work at it, work at that piece, and uh, practice, <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Thank you. Right. Come on. Excellent. Let's bring in the closer. I love that because you're right, it is. I mean, obviously you're right, you're a Hall of Famer. This is remarkable, right? <laughs> this moment, to find that one strength and to make it almost unbeatable, yeah. that seems to be pretty analogous to Manny Jackson's journey. Kind of what goes on in life. Yeah. And most of us, I think the reason to go to college is to figure out what we're good at. Yeah. And you practice to figure out what you're best at and what you're willing to commit the time to. But you gotta know it and you gotta be head and shoulder of anyone else or because you put the time in on it and you have a natural tendency to do it. Yes, sir. Hello. My name's Lee Durkin, and Mr. Jackson, how would you say you developed your mental strength to deal with the segregation and the impression, like, in your career of being, like, a Harlem Grove trotter? My, uh, I was telling uh, Fran over at lunch today that, that my, my grandfather, Great-grandfather was, uh, was, a, was a, like a slave, slave uh -huh. family. My grandfather heard slave stories. My father went to World War II as an engineer and as a, as a Navy, and was exposed to all the crap that goes on at war. Mm -hmm. And when he came back, he couldn't eat in certain restaurants or go to certain places. But you know what? We kind of grew up around 
we, I mean people, grew up around the dinner table and, and with your families. Yeah. And the, family, the stories your family chooses to tell and the tone they use to tell them really affects your life. Definitely. What you have to listen to. They can tell there's good news or growing news or just something they want to talk about. My family had all those sometimes adverse experiences, but they always talked about them with strength. Okay. And I think uh, my attitude was, I can't complain because it rains in the morning. I got, still got to go to work. I can't complain because some fool thinks his DNA is better than my DNA. That's his problem, not mine. And I know that people spend a lot of time on differences. That's stupid. I mean, in the scheme, of the universe has us looking like that smaller than that ball out there someplace. What they, all they see is a bunch of ants running around out down here. And we spend a lot of time on differences. I think we're better as a society if we focus on what we have in common. And what I loved about sports, when you throw us all out of together, that basketball courts, same length for everybody, that hoop is 10 feet, and you gotta be the shooter or you go home. <laughs> You know, the truth is, I said, show me a place where I can level the playing floor, make the distance the same, show me a place where the hoop is 10 foot, we'll be all right. And I view all of life as being just that way. Uh -huh. And my parents, despite the things they'd gone through, they had a very positive outlook. I told someone this morning, they asked the question, I don't understand uh, unforgive people can't forgive. I don't understand hatred. I don't understand remorse even because my training over the dinner table and over the breakfast table was always, let's go forward. Definitely. And, okay? Definitely, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Mr. Jackson, before we close, and we are about to, I wanna say personally that I have spent the last several, two decades interviewing people, um, and I've never spent a more meaningful 30 minutes than I wow. just have, and I mean that sincerely. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please give a warm thank you to class of 2017's Mr. Manny Jackson.